welcome to the worship of God's people in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, remember that there's no Wednesday evening, uh, no Wednesday evening program until June the 30th. And a lot of that uh, is revolving around Vacation Bible School, which is starting up not tomorrow, but Monday week, as we say, uh, in these parts. So we start up in a week. But that also means that following this service this morning, if any of you would be available to help begin to move some chairs out of the fellowship hall next door into a room so that, that can begin to be set up. Uh, there will be some people over there doing that. Um, it should be pretty quick and, uh, from what I understand, not dirty work or anything like that. Um, and then probably there will be some things going on this evening following the evening service as well. Uh, but if you would be willing or able to help, and if you have any questions, also you can see Cheryl Farquhar, who will be up here near the organ at the end of the service, um, at least initially. And then Debbie speak as well. So um, let me encourage you to speak with them if you'd be interested in ways that you can help. Let's continue now to prepare our hearts to come before the Lord. Thank you. 
together. Glorious and eternal God in heaven, we praise you that you will reign for all of eternity. We praise you, Father, for from you, through you, to you are all things. To you alone be the glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, you have redeemed us. You have purchased us out of darkness. You have placed us over in the kingdom of your beloved Son, that we might be your people, that we might give you praise. And so help us to do that now, Lord, in a way that honors and glorifies you alone, but also in a way that, uh, that our souls are nourished and we more closely reflect the character of our Heavenly Father. Through Christ our Savior, we pray. Be seated. As we continue to use selections from the Westminster Confession uh, and catechisms and our confessions of faith, uh, you'll notice that, um, that we focus a little bit this morning on the Word of God, just the nature of the Word of God, especially in the, uh, in the second question and answer. Uh, there is a lot about, you, you really might paraphrase it as the content and the effect, and, and yet at the same time our dependence upon the Holy Spirit with regard to the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is in itself clearly evident to be the Word of God. By its consistency, by its content, by its effect to, to convict sinners of their sin, to be used to bring us to saving faith in Christ, and yet we still need the third person of God. We still need the Holy Spirit to open our hearts, to open our eyes so that we see how the Word of God applies to our lives, to see about the Word of God what is clearly there. And so as we confess together, what is the Word of God? How does it appear that the scriptures are the Word of God?
found to be faithful stewards of your many gifts and blessings. May our gifts be used to further the work of your kingdom, so that those around the world may sing the very words which we have just sung. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Accept our gifts today, and we give them with great thanksgiving through Christ our Lord.
rejoice today in your presence with us. And we come before you to acknowledge humbly our dependence upon you. How we thank you for the joy that is ours in Christ. And we pray that you would incline our hearts fervently and regularly love you and to embrace your will for our lives. We come before you today because you have enjoined us to come and to bring our request to you. Lord, you have promised that you would show us great and mighty marvelous works that we know not. If we come asking and seeking and knocking, you are the God who works on behalf of his people to accomplish his purpose in and through us, to bring glory to yourself. And yet we pray, Father, that we might, in every way as a church body, proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord to this community and to how we thank you, Father, for the promise that you are slow to anger and a God who abounds in loving kindness, because we find ourselves so often in need of forgiveness, so often as we pray that you would search our hearts to see if there be any hurtful way within us. We ask that you would turn us from our sin and wickedness, that we might repent, and that we might once again walk in righteousness. We come before you as sinners, Lord, redeemed sinners, but those who know that you have died and shed your blood through your Son on our behalf. And now we pray, Father, that we might take this to heart, the love that you have for us, and may our response always be to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Our Heavenly Father, we come seeking to do your will, thankful for the opportunities that you place before us to minister to one another and to this community. And before us now is the opportunity to reach out to our covenant children and to those children in the community and to bring the gospel message to them so that they would grow strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We pray for all of those who have volunteered to lead and direct and vacation Bible school. We pray for the registration of children, and we pray that hearts would be opened. I see for the first time that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you love the world so much that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting do not take for granted, O Lord, that this gospel message has penetrated to the degree that it should even within the church. And we pray, Father, that children and young people would grow to love you as their personal Lord and Savior. We pray, Father, that as we train and uh, seek spread the gospel around the world that you would bless the ministry of those who have been here as interns, those who have ministered and have been called forth to labor for you. And we pray on their behalf that they would reach many hearts with the gospel message. We thank you, our Father, for the knowledge that your word is true. Not one word has ever failed of all your faithful promise. We 
know that it has been breathed out of your mouth. For our benefit, it is profitable to show us where we have gone wrong, to show us how to get on the right path, how that we might be trained in righteousness. Lord, may we hide your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. Be with Pastor Martin as he brings the word today. May it go forth as a means of strength and the very anchor of our souls. For we pray through Christ our Lord. Turn with me this morning to Acts chapter 3. To Acts chapter 3, we'll be picking up in verse 11. And uh, as we prepare to read it, there's sort of a parallel between uh, chapter 2 and then some of what we see in chapters 3 and 4. And that is, uh, the parallel is this. In both instances, we see, uh, we see a miracle, and then we see a sermon, and then we see a response. Now, if we go back and we look at chapter 2 again, if you were here, you might remember that, that there's Pentecost, when the Spirit is poured out in power, when uh, it is as if flames of tongue come to uh, descend upon those that are in uh, the room, and then we see them begin to speak in tongues, that is, other languages, so people that would have, uh, the way we would say today, you know, people that have no way of knowing Mandarin, German or Swahili or Portuguese start speaking in these languages, proclaiming the mighty deeds of God. And no doubt part of what they're proclaiming is the mighty deeds of God to save a people from their sin. And 
thousands are converted. Thousands are converted. And the church explodes in a way that uh, that um, maybe is unparalleled in all of the history of the Christian church. Now we see something similar when we get to chapters 3 and 4. There is this miracle of healing that uh, Peter heals someone who is lame, and then Peter uses that opportunity to preach a sermon. But then we don't see thousands converted. What we see is opposition. It's not miracle sermon positive response. It's miracle sermon negative response. Miracle sermon hostility. Now ask yourself, why? What is it about the sermon that garners so much hostility toward the Apostle Peter? Well, we read beginning in verse 11. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. And when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you but put to death the Prince of Life, the one who God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is in the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect help in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything that he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these things. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do pray again that you would lay open our hearts and that by the help of your spirit, you would enable us to understand. And not just understand, Lord, but to take to heart to see that this passage is about us. This passage convicts and confronts us, but that this passage also offers hope and blessing to us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. You know, in, in Christian circles, uh, we talk often about giving our testimony. And by that, we mean speaking about how we came to know Christ or what we mean when we say that we're a Christian. And sometimes we get into the details of how that happened. For one person, it's they grew up in a church where they never remember a day when they were not told that they were sinners and pointed to Christ. For some people, they grew up in a secular background and they were driving down the road one night listening to some preacher on the radio. Uh, for some, they were in a hotel room and they picked up one of those Bibles that was sitting there and they, and they read through it. And uh, for others, it was the testimony of a, of a, of a friend 
with someone that they knew. Uh, people can talk about all, all the different ways that we came to know Christ as our Savior. Now, here is a danger and a temptation to giving our testimony. Here's a danger and a temptation when you give your testimony. It is that you can talk too much about yourself. You can talk about your experience rather than Christ. And especially if your experience was really, um, really kind of striking. If you were sort of one of those prison conversions, so to speak, or someone that was really way out here, and then the Lord brought you all the way back around and way over here. Those are sort of riveting stories, and, and we, we can tell them, and people want to hear them. The danger is that we talk about our experience rather than Christ. And, and one of the things that you notice about Peter, it's really fascinating here, is we unpack the passages. He takes this miracle, but then he pivots hard and fast to Christ Jesus. Uh, Peter has no interest in talking about what he did. Peter really wants to talk about Christ and who Christ is. Now, the people might want to hear about the miracle. They're running and they're crowding around, and, and no doubt they want to hear the details. They want to understand how this happened. Peter touches on it, but he touches on it very briefly and pivots hard and fast and then camps out on Jesus Christ. So here's the point. Very often what you and I need to do is take the situation and use it to deflect to Christ. To deflect to Christ. Not to talk about ourselves. Not to tell people how they can have the same experience that we had. But to point people to Christ. Never miss an opportunity to deflect souls to what they really need. And it's just our nature as human beings. What we think we need is very often not what we need. I was walking through the store today, and there were the end caps, and, and there, were the, there were the hostess Swiss rolls. I felt a need. But it wasn't a real need. You know, and, and we, we sort of like certain things, the interesting things, the fun things, the pleasurable things. But sometimes that's not what we need. And, and people will often talk religion or they'll want to understand how somebody's life changed, but what they really need to hear about is Christ. Never miss an opportunity to deflect souls to what they really need. Notice first in verses 11 through 13, Peter deflects from the miracles to the Messiah. He deflects from the miracles to the Messiah. Notice the man is clinging to, to Peter and John, this man who has been healed now, this man who has stood up and walked and begun to leap and to give praise to God, he's now clinging to Peter and the others. And the, the people are running to them in the portico of Solomon. You can picture the scene, can't you? All the, this crowd is just running and gathering around to see what is, uh, to see what's happening. But notice um, what Peter says in verse 12. Men of Israel... Why are you so amazed? That's kind of a funny thing to say, isn't it? I mean, a man who was lame from birth is now walking. Why are you so amazed? Well, a lot of reasons human to speaking, we might be amazed. But then Peter, again, he, he moves quickly and says, Why are you amazed as if by our own piety or our own power or piety we had made this man walk? Why, why do you think? That by our power, by something inherent in us, because we're really special and powerful and, and gifted in some way, why do you think that that's why this man is walking? Why do you think that by our own piety or our own godliness, our own virtue, um, why, why do you think that by being exemplary moral examples, we would, uh, by being virtuous, do you think that that is how this man is walking? And then he goes, again, look at the pivot in verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of, of Pilate. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you disowned him. We'll come back to this in a moment. You, you in fact, you had him murdered. But God has raised him up. God has, has glorified him. God has glorified Jesus. And we, we touched on this this morning. In Sunday school, Jesus is a name that essentially means God saves. Christ is a title that means Messiah or anointed one. And so 
Jesus Christ is is the one who is named God saves because he will save his people from their sin. And he is the Messiah in that he has been anointed by God to save his people from their sin. So when we talk about Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, we're using both a name and a title. But what, what Peter says here is you delivered him over and you disowned him. God has glorified him. And the miracle you see flows from the glory of Christ Jesus. The miracle cannot be separated from the exaltation of Christ because all that the apostles are doing is they are reflecting the miraculous powers of Christ because they are representing Christ to tell sinners they need Christ and what Christ has done to save them from their sins. So again, Peter is not basking in the glory of telling the story of what he did. You know, you see those things sometimes, don't you? Some, uh, some man chased a purse snatcher down the street and tackled him, or somebody, you know, you know you'll see it on the news, and, you know, sometimes I get, you'll even see funny ones, it's some guy without a shirt standing out in front of the store telling about how he was just walking down the street and he saw something, he jumped into action, and, and he was able to save this person, and he was able to help that person. Um, well, that's not what Peter is doing at all. Peter has no interest in having the mic stuck in his face so that he can talk about what he did. He simply pivots. He deflects to Christ. One of the things that you see throughout the pages of the New Testament is people trying to worship the servants of Christ rather than worship Christ. Trying to venerate the servants of Christ rather than Christ himself. If, if we were to sort of go through the, the New Testament in, uh, in Acts chapter 10, you remember that Peter is sent to the household of Cornelius, and when he walks in, Cornelius falls at his feet in veneration. Cornelius falls at his feet to worship him. And what's Peter do? Peter says, get up. Don't do that. I'm a man just like you. Or later, Paul and Barnabas in chapter 14 when they're in Lystra. And, uh, you know, for whatever reasons, and we'll explore that when we get to it in months, but for whatever reasons, uh, they, they want to see Paul as Hermes and they want to see Barnabas as Zeus. And when Paul and Barnabas are instrumental in, in effecting certain miracles, then what we see is they want to offer sacrifices. They want to worship Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas are appalled. They tear their clothing. They run into the midst of the men. They say, do not do this. I mean, this is the paganism to which you've been enslaved your whole life. This is the thing of which you need to repent. We are not gods. We're bringing to you a message of the way that the one true God saves sinners. Well, then at, in Revelation, uh, at the very end, and I, I get a little bit amused that John, John messes up on this repeatedly before angelic creatures. Uh, in Revelation 19, John falls down before one of the angels to worship him. The angel's like, don't do that, get up. And then at the very end, in Revelation 22, same thing. And, and, he's, and he's told, don't do that. Do, you don't worship an angel. You worship God alone. So Peter deflects from the miracles to the Messiah. Peter is one of the, he's an apostle, and you can make an argument, one of the, the more central apostles in the formation of the Christian church. And Peter deflects attention from himself. Peter does not want the attention on him. So there are quick reminders. Uh, never seek glory for yourself. Never seek glory for yourself. And beware when you like the glory people are trying to give you. Never seek glory for yourself. Ananias and Sapphira, they try to seek glory by acting like they give something that they don't. We'll see that in a, in a few weeks. And we know how it ends for Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Herod Agrippa I allowed the people to simply call out to him in chapter 12, the voice of a god and not a king, the voice of a god and not a king. And you remember God struck him so that he died horribly. Now, Herod didn't do anything except let them praise him. 
don't let people praise you. I know Herod was a wicked man and all of that, but, but you and I should never want praise for ourselves. The point is never to tell our story. I get a little bit amused. Um, listen, I'm not saying Facebook sin or even updating your story on Facebook. That's, that's not sin. But I'll, I, I find it a little bit funny that I'll, and even from family members, they will pop up so and so has updated their story. And I often think, you know, my story's just really boring. I don't really think I'm going to update my story. Years ago, when uh, you remember when blogs became common and people were starting to keep blogs and they were giving their opinion on a lot of things, I came home one day and I told my wife, I don't think I should blog. Because I don't think there's anybody any, anywhere in the world going, I wonder what Marty thinks about this. I think I'll jump on his blog and get his perspective. I mean, just you nobody know, cares. Not about me, maybe about you, but not about me. Never seek glory for yourself. Peter is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he deflects glory from himself to Christ. And really, everything that happens is an opportunity to deflect from ourselves to Christ. It might be a great thing uh, that we've been used to do, that we've been instrumental in the Lord's kingdom, and it's an opportunity to then talk about how Christ has used a worm like me or a piece of dirt like you. It is always an opportunity to deflect to Christ. And when we experience hard things, when there are eruptions of sin in our lives, sin done by us, sin done to us, it is an opportunity to be reminded of the cross of Jesus Christ. That on the cross, Jesus died for that sin. That Christ died for that sin that you've committed or that struggle that you continue to have. If you're in Christ, that means he has paid the penalty for it once and for all. That gives us great hope. That transforms the way that we deal with struggles. So never miss an opportunity to deflect souls to what they really need. Peter deflects from the miracles to the Messiah. But that does not mean in verses 13 through 15 that he doesn't really press the point that they are more than a little guilty. It is our tendency when we say hard things to people, we don't want to offend them. I mean, unless we just like offending people, that's a different hard issue, certainly for another day. But most of us, we don't like to offend people and we don't like the conflict. And we fear how people will respond if we say something to them that we know is going to be pretty confrontational. But Peter, it, Peter is in some ways more confrontational in this sermon than he was in the one in Acts 2. He says four times, he says, you did this, you did this, you did this. Look at verses 13 through 15. He says, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered. He goes on to say, the one whom you disowned. In the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him, Pilate, who was a wicked, brutal, sometimes vicious pagan magistrate, wanted to cut him loose, and you manipulated him so that Pilate would have him killed. He goes on in verse 14, but you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life the one who God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Um, you disown the holy and righteous one. You ask for one who took human life to be released, and you had murder put to death the author of life. Do you see the contrast that Peter is, uh, is painting? He's saying this is how glorious and good and majestic and holy Christ is, which shows all the more how wickedly you acted against him. It was the grace that the cross was the greatest sin in all of human history. Not the garden, not the sin of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, not the sin of, of Babylon or any other place that you and I might, uh, any other wicked times and places that we might find in the scriptures. The cross was the greatest sin in history. And Peter's saying, if you didn't just mess up a little bit, you killed the Lord of life. You killed the one, the second person of the one true God. 
And yeah, that was the that was the will of God. That was the plan of God. But you're more than a little guilty. Do you understand today that you're more than a little bit guilty? I mean, you just haven't just made some mistakes and some bad decisions. You decided to do what a dark heart wanted to do. You made a bad decision because you decided according to a pattern of thought that was not to give glory to the one true God. You know, we all want to think that we're really not that bad. I recently told my wife I'm a bit of a fitness fundamentalist, so I run. And um, this past week, I was very proud that my garment told me, um, you are in the top 15% of men your age. My daughter, I showed it to her, and she said, Dad, what does that say about most men your age? I was like, that's not the point. Don't be trying to knock me down a notch. And, but I told my wife, I said, I'm kind of a fitness fundamentalist because what I think is, you know, as long as I'm better than most people, I'm okay. As long as I'm in better shape than 80% of people, that's good, right? I mean, that's a win. Even though I never live up to my own potential, certainly what I should um, do to take care of myself. And, and the point here is we all tend to like to come up with some reason to think that we're okay. We think that we would have done better than he that we would have rejected the enticements of the serpent or that we'd have done better than Adam and we'd have come to the rescue and encouraged our wife, let's get out of here. We think that we're better than the Sanhedrin. Um, we think that we're better than the crowds that murdered Jesus. And the reality of it is we're all more than a little bit guilty. We're some combination of secularly, secularly indifferent to God. We really don't think about God a lot. We just kind of want to we want to enjoy and do the things of this age. All of us tend to be users. We want to use God to get answers to our problems and provide us the things that we want rather than be used of Him to glorify His own name. We're all self-righteous. You know, I mean, just about everybody thinks that they're better than most. but you're more than a little guilty. You and I would have done no better. Ladies, you'd have done no better than Eve. Guys, you'd have done no better than Adam. None of us would have done better than the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, all of those that we see conspiring against Christ. We are all more than a little bit guilty, which is, again, why, uh, why each one of us made the cross of Jesus Christ necessary. None of us were there 2,000 years ago participating in his actual execution. But he had to offer himself up on the cross for there to be any way for you to be saved from your sin. So do you understand that in a very real sense, you are responsible? You are responsible for the death of the Son of God on a cross. You and I are more than a little bit guilty. So, do you realize that you're more than just a little bit guilty? Are you more bothered by your own sin than anything else in this world? Let me ask that again. I mean, we all are bothered by a lot of things. I don't know many people that just aren't bothered by anything. But are you more bothered by your own sin than anything else in this world? Because even our own sin, when we're bothered by it, it that, that should drive us, that should deflect us to Christ, to what we really need. So finally, we see in verses 16 through 17, this 180 degree change of heart. Now you remember that back in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus, is, or when Peter is really pointed, he says, uh, Therefore let all of Israel know for certain God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So he gets really, as a friend of mine says, he crawls up in their grill. He gets in their face. He points out the magnitude of their sin. But you notice that Peter, he is, he is pointing out their sin here as well. But uh, they don't seem to ask, which doesn't surprise us because we'll see in the next chapter that there's hostility. But he gives them the answer anyway. In verse 19, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come 
from the presence of God. You know, so what Peter says there is, you need to repent, which means, it, it simply has to do with turning, you need to repent and return to the God against whom you have sinned. And there's blessing in that. God will bring times of refreshing. God will bring great joy. God will bring great blessing. That doesn't mean that life gets easy. It doesn't mean that we get everything that we want in this age. But repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And if we went back up and we looked at verses 16 and following, uh, Peter says, on the basis of faith in his name, he's talking about the name of Jesus, it is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. So uh, Peter begins by saying, this man has been healed by the power of God, and this man's healing has not been separated from faith in Christ. The healing is on the basis of faith, uh, faith through Christ, faith in Christ. It's not apart from uh, from a faith in Christ. And then Peter immediately uses that as an opportunity to talk about how you don't have faith in Christ, or you've not had faith in Christ, verses 17 and following. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. And there's ignorance, but it's an ignorance that is still culpable. They're guilty for this ignorance. I say this from time to time. My father would, um, you know, I was a bit of a self-righteous arguer, hard to believe, and my dad would sometimes confront me when I was doing something I shouldn't, and I would often have very elaborate and, I believe, quite skillful and logical arguments to explain why I wasn't wrong for what I was doing. He, would just, he just had no use for it. He would just look at me and go, you know better than that. Well, no, Dad, you didn't tell me, yeah, but you know better. Well, maybe I didn't know better. Well, then you should have known better. So I didn't really, there was no, Dad's arguments were not nuanced. You should have known better. You know, you, um, you acted ignorantly, just as your rulers did. But you're guilty just the same. And you should have known better because he goes on to say, God announced this through the prophets that the Christ would have to suffer. This is not some new thing that we're coming up with. This is not some new thing that we're coming up with in the 30s A.D. This goes all the way back to the thousands of years of God giving his word in the Old Testament. This was always something God told you was going to happen. So, in verse 19, repent and return. And then he goes on uh, and says uh, in verse 21 following, whom heaven, he's speaking about Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of the restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. And then he goes on to quote Moses, who said, God will give you a prophet similar to me in ways, but obviously ultimately greater than Moses. And, and you're going to listen to him, but those who will not listen to him will be destroyed. So understand, what you're getting here in a very compressed form is Peter is talking about the incarnation, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the imminent return of Christ. That is the constant message of the early church. God the Son took to himself a human body, came into our midst, lived a sinless life in obedience to his heavenly Father, died a horrid death at our hands for our sin, was raised from the dead, has ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and one day he will come to judge those who are spiritually living and those who are spiritually dead, those who have lived and died already and those that are still alive. He will return in judgment. Every soul that does not heed him, as Moses said, will be utterly destroyed. So what's the point? You see how confrontational Peter's sermon is. You murdered the God who made you and came to purchase salvation for sinners. So, and he is coming back, and he will deal, though, deal with those that still reject him. So, what's your only hope? It is to repent and return to the very one against whom you sinned. And he goes on to say, in so many words, uh, Peter's saying, y'all should know this, from Samuel onward, 
All of the Old Testament prophets told you this. And you're sons of the prophet and sons of the covenant. So you should know what his word says. And the gospel came to you first because Christ came into the nation of, of Israel, right? 2,000 years ago. He came to those who were ostensibly his people. The gospel, Peter says, was it is to you first and then through you to all the families of the earth. But here's what you need to do. You need to recognize your sin against the God who is offering you salvation and you need to turn to him. That is the only hope you have. And, and you... You think that if we could just somehow or another replicate this thing so everybody who's sick could start walking or get over whatever other illness it is that they have. That's not what you really need. So repent and return. Down in verse 26, For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. What Peter's doing here very much is what we call the free offer of the gospel. He's not debating, he's not trying to figure out upon whom God set his love from before the foundations of the world. That's not his place to figure that out. What he's doing is he's presenting them with the reality of their sin and the free offer of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So never miss an opportunity to deflect souls to what they really need. Now that means we need to be we need to be honest about the bad news. Just like any doctor who is really a faithful doctor will be honest when there is bad news. If somebody comes in and five arteries are 99% blocked, he doesn't tell them you're ready for a marathon. He doesn't do that. He can tell people things to make them feel good, but he doesn't do that. If there's clearly a malignant mass, he doesn't say there's nothing there that has to be addressed. He's going to be honest about um, the bad news. But that's but just telling people bad news is not where we end. You know, there, there can be a tendency, and probably for many in our circles, to condemn culture and denounce people that live and behave in certain ways. But condemnation is is not the gospel. Condemnation is a, 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 the, the reality of sin is part of what we have to say to people. We have to say it honestly. But then we're not really doing what Peter's doing here. We're not doing what the Scriptures call us to do if we don't say to them, but there's hope. There is salvation. There is deliverance for you just as there, as there was for me. Not because of my own power or piety. Because God is a gracious and faithful God, but you have to repent and return. You have to turn to the God against whom you've, you've sinned. And, and if people really are turning to Christ, there's genuine repentance that manifests itself. It becomes evident in life. Uh, contrition is not repentance. That is to say, when people just feel bad about what they're doing, that's not really repentance. Now, that, that is hopefully a first step toward repentance, but contrition is, is not repentance. A constraint is not conversion. Just keeping people from doing bad things doesn't mean that they're converted. Repentance is turning from and to, and those things always go together, turning from our sin to God with a desire that he would save us and deliver us from it. So never miss an opportunity to deflect souls to what they really need. There are always eruptions of sin in this world. Uh, in this fallen and twisted world. But when we see those eruptions of sin, it is an opportunity to talk about the universality of sin in the human race, except for Jesus Christ. And it is an opportunity to speak about God's mercy and what he has done to deliver us from sin and to send uh, times of refreshing and to bring us into his presence. But here's something really interesting. If you ever thought about this, the world, with this message of good news, of salvation by grace through faith in Christ, the world has nothing like it. Because all the world can do is this. It can only condemn or turn a blind eye. Let me say that again. The world can only condemn or turn a blind eye. It can turn a blind eye and say, well, I don't think it's really a problem. But if God says it's a problem, then it's sin before God. And that's what matters. It doesn't matter what the world says. Or the world can condemn. 
Someone in an article in the last uh, couple of years, and some of this had to do with social media and all of that stuff, somebody said, what you see in the world now is there is no forgiveness. If you did something 15 years ago and showed up online, it doesn't matter if you've been converted, repentant, gone to make amends, utterly changed, reject that way of thinking. Somebody will drag it out, put it up in front of everybody, and say you're still guilty. And the good news of the scriptures is, I can be guilty and forgiven. The gospel is the only thing that gives us the ability to say, yeah, what I did was horrid. The way I've lived is, is, is twisted. But Christ died on the cross to atone for my sin and by the power of His Spirit. He has delivered me from that sin. And that's the hope that Peter holds out. That's the hope that we hold out. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Never miss an opportunity to deflect, to deflect souls to what they really need. John Stott, in one of his commentaries, he tells, speaking to the director of a large mental health institution in the UK, and he said at one point, this director, who I, I, I assume was a Christian, said to John Stott, I could send half of my patients home tomorrow if only they could find forgiveness. I could send half of them home tomorrow if they could just find forgiveness. But the world just keeps reposting the video. And the devil loves for you to watch that video. And says, but this is what you are. The gospel says, this may be what you are, but it does not have to be what you continue to be. The gospel says, that may have been true of you, but you have been washed, you have been cleansed, you have been forgiven, you have been sanctified. Never miss an opportunity to, to deflect souls to what they really need. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we we rejoice in this word this morning. We praise you, Father, that that um, that you are a God who loves us so greatly that you are honest with us about the reality of sin. And even our, un, our own hopelessness to atone for our own sin. But Father, we praise you that also you are honest that we might see our need and that we might receive what you offer. So Father, we pray now that you would, that you would remind those who know you that their guilt has been cleansed, that that load and that weight of guilt has been taken away. Father, for those uh, who might be trying to negotiate with you and, and find some middle ground, Lord, bring them to see the misery of that middle ground, that they might repent and return. Uh, Lord, give us grace as we speak to those who don't know you, that we, would, uh, that we would not merely speak words of condemnation about them or even to them, but that we would, with love and a broken heart, speak about the reality of sin but also, Lord, point them to the only one that can take away sin. And we praise you, Father, for the gift that has been given for our salvation. Through Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. Let's conclude now by singing together hymn number 529. We'll sing stances one through four. Let's stand together as we sing. Thank you. 